The pursuit of equality, identity, and hope has drawn Asian immigrants to the shores of the United States for generations. From the California gold rush in the 1800s and the construction of the Transcontinental Railroad, to the Asian American heroes who fought in World War II, to the civil rights leaders of the past and present, and to today's frontline workers, Asian Americans have been an integral part of building our nation from the ground up. Asian Americans are the fastest growing ethnic group in the United States, representing more than 20 countries of origin. But racist rhetoric around the coronavirus pandemic has sparked a resurgence in anti-Asian hate in the midst of already rising racial tensions. Asian Americans are being spat at, beaten, and even killed just because of the way we look. In this program, we'll examine the other public health crisis affecting Asian Americans, anti-Asian hate. Joining this discussion are leading thinkers and advocates who will explore how anti-Asian hate is rooted in the past and how what we do now will impact future generations. From Comcast Newsmakers, this is Equality, Identity, and Hope, the Asian American Experience. Hello, I'm Ellie Pai Hong. More than a year into the coronavirus pandemic, anti-Asian hate is taking its toll. A recent study found that anti-Asian hate crimes increased by almost 150% in 2020. And in the midst of civil unrest, police killings, and the Black Lives Matter movement, allies of all races are pushing for change and taking a stand against institutional racism. Today, we look at how anti-Asian hate is rooted in history and policies of exclusion. We're going to share the Asian American story of struggle and perseverance in the face of racist policies throughout U.S. history. We'll also explore how the civil rights movement shaped Asian American identity and the struggle for justice and equality. My guests, Cynthia Che, co-executive director of Chinese for Affirmative Action, a 50-year-old civil rights organization based in San Francisco and founding member of Stop AAPI Hate. Amherst College American Studies professor Pavan Dingra, author of Hyper Education, Why Good Schools, Good Grades, and Good Behavior Are Not Enough. And Imani Perry, professor of African American Studies at Princeton University and author of Breathe, A Letter to My Sons. And for our viewers, please join the conversation. We'll be responding to your questions and comments in the live chat. In the last few months, a Filipino man was slashed with a box cutter on the subway. An elderly Chinese woman was slapped and set on fire. A man of Thai descent was shoved and killed in San Francisco. And in Atlanta, six Asian women were murdered. Cynthia, I just want to check with you to see how you've been dealing with the news and what's going on all around us. Sure. You know, as somebody who had been starting, you know, to study some of the incidents that were coming in through our reporting center, these recent news accounts, uh, especially the uh, mass shooting in at the Atlanta area, and of course the Indiana um, mass shooting um, has just been devastating. And I think I personally have reached my breaking point um, and it's been very, very difficult had I not been, you know, with my community and, and so many others who, you know, we've wept, we've consoled each other and, and yet we have to still keep going. But this is, this is a really hard time. The data is staggering. Stop API Hate logged more than 6,600 reports of Asian American hate incidents from March 2020 to March 2021. Cynthia, you founded AAPI Hate with two other scholars right before the lockdown. Tell us what motivated you to do that. As you pointed out, this, this isn't anything new to our community. It actually defines our experience. And it's one of the reasons why we started Stop API Hate. Uh, we saw that Asians were reporting that they were uh, being verbally harassed, uh, discriminated against, and in some cases experienced physical assaults. Uh, and we also learned that women in particular were vulnerable to these attacks. Um, and I wanna point out that while a majority of our incidents, upwards of 90% were not hate crimes, uh, they still need to be taken seriously because we do believe that 
without interventions that they will escalate. And certainly we have seen incidents of violence directed uh, at our community, including the mass shooting in Indianapolis. So this is a very serious issue and it's something that we believe that we all need to respond to during this time. Cindy, I'd love to know, because you started this organization before um, hate crimes started spiking after the pandemic shutdown in March of last year. And since tracking that, what are the trends that you've been noticing and what do you find to be the most surprising? What we've seen is that while uh, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders are going about their daily lives, uh, going to the grocery store, um, going to the places that we're limited to going to during this public health crisis, that Asians are being targeted, racially profiled, and have been attacked. We're getting incident reports from all 50 states and that we are certainly seeing a majority of these incidents coming from places like California and New York where we have significant Asian populations. Um, and we are very concerned that as uh, the economy starts to open up, as children return to school, that matters will escalate. Uh, and so these are patterns that I think uh, speak to the issue that um, uh, needs to have a much more multifaceted approach to addressing systemic racism directed at our community. I think that data is sparking fear and really difficult conversations. I wanna play this clip from Jane Park. She's a mother of two in Seattle, Washington. She went viral for this TikTok post. Ready for another sight word test? Yep. yep. There's a message in this one, so I want you to think about it, okay? Stop. Stop. Asian. Asian. Hate. 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 Is. Eat. A. I. Virus. 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 Well, why would we call hate a virus? Because viruses infect, infect people. They infect people. Do you think hate can do the same thing? Mm -hmm. Like feel, make, feel, make people feel bad. Racism is is that somebody is that if somebody looks different they say that they're like not as good as the other mm -hmm. because they look different based on the color of their skin or like if they're asian and we talked about recent acts of violence against asian americans mm -hmm. and how did that make you feel sad because they killed people mm -hmm. they yeah. killed asian people yeah and that could be somebody that we know right mm -hmm. How do you think we should respond to things like that? Like, not liking it. We can speak out against it. Mm -hmm. We can talk about it. Mm -hmm. We can build awareness, okay. right? Because mm -hmm. not everybody might know what's going on, mm -hmm. right? You know, as a Korean American woman and a mom, this is something that I can really relate to. And my children are older, so my conversations are a lot more candid with them. But the number one thing that I tell them is don't stay silent because silence never leads to change. So I wanna take a step back from this data and ask you, what kinds of conversations are you having at your dinner table? Pavan, if I could start with you. We were talking a lot about what's been going on we attended a vigil recently uh, for online for the shootings in Indianapolis. Uh, we've gone to protests uh, in our local town around the, sh the shootings in Atlanta, uh, Black Lives Matter. We talked not only about what's been going on, but also the narratives of how they're being discussed in the media. For instance, the FBI talked about how uh, there were the shootings in Indianapolis had no racial motive, but we now know that's not necessarily the case. The police officer who spoke to the public after the Atlanta shootings spoke about how the shooter was at the end of his rope but had a bad day. We felt sorry for the shooter. Uh, so in other words, we have to understand when we talk to my kids about how you know, we have to see what's going on, what's causing the violence, but also how are people referring to it. We have to make sure that they're talking about it appropriately. I have a high school child 
and a middle school child. And they're old enough for us to talk about these things and engage in these things in a meaningful way, trying to be sensitive to where they're at emotionally, but not shying away from saying, listen, there's a problem out there, both of what's going on and how people are talking about what's going on. And Amani, I'd love to get your perspective on how you're talking about this with your children. I talked to them about how the society, the U.S. society that denied naturalization for Asian Americans, that um, excluded Asian people from citizenship, historically is the same society that produced Jim Crow, that these things were built in tandem, right? A system of exclusion directed towards one group and a system of being lower in, the, in stratification for the other. And so even though those forms don't exist in precisely the same way now, the ideas and practices and residues of that persist so that they understand that their experience as racialized people uh, in the United States um, may be distinct from that of other people of color, but these are connected histories and that for that reason, solidarity is extremely important and, um, and that they have a responsibility uh, to, to be um, ethical bystanders, uh, but also to really deeply think about what it means to understand and acknowledge the histories of various people with respect to injustice in the society. And Cynthia, I'd like to ask you this question because not only are we having to have discussions with our children, but we have to talk to our elderly parents about just being careful as they walk out the door. This isn't something that they worried about, um, you know, when I was younger and they were the adults because they might have gotten verbally harassed, but it wasn't a physical assault in any shape or form. This is deeply personal. Um, I have three daughters um, and we talk about uh, this issue, it, it's part of our discourse and our family. Um, I am one of those parents that forced my kids to watch the PBS uh, series on Asian Americans. And these are conversations that I've had with my own parents and my mother in particular, who has felt very vulnerable. Um, but she's also said to me, you know, we have to keep living our lives as well. Um, and so she refuses to um, you know, shelter in place. It's a few things that she can enjoy right now is to be out, um, but she is hyper aware. And it's, it's a conversation that we're having about this racial reckoning that affects so many of us and, and across other communities too, including uh, the murder of George Floyd and, and so many others. So this is part of what we talk about as a family because it's important that we're engaged and we understand what's happening and make those connections. And I think it's also important to ask, how did we get here, Imani? The answer to how we got here is uh, a long history of um, systematic forms of exclusion that range from um, the Chinese exclusion law to placing in concentration camps of Japanese Americans in the context of World War II. There were mechanisms for the dispossession of Asian American landowners at various points in history. The language that we often use for the historic anti-Asian, anti-Asian American violence is this concept of yellow peril, which is sort of predicated on this idea um, that Asian people are dangerous, um, dangerous in terms of um, disease or political threat, or that they will um, come into the American society and somehow disrupt um, the effective functioning of the country. Um, and of course, it's all, pre it's all based in uh, kind of racist ideologies and stereotypes, but it continues, it has a, a repetitive cycle um, in American history, so that it is very easy to trigger this kind of collective fear um, of, of Asian people in American culture. And we find it in media, we find it in popular culture, we find it in just the kind of um, attitudes that persist, whether we're talking about academics or neighborhoods or political, um, you know, uh, political disputes or in the case of coronavirus, public health crises that are um, 
that lead to very misdirected fears and violence. And we will talk more about that historical perspective in just a bit, because I think that's really important to explore further. But hate crimes went up 150% over the past year. It was a sharp spike in those numbers. What do you think led up to that? Uh, Pavan, if I could ask you. Yeah, I think that as Dr. Perry alluded to, right, when, um, when, the, when Americans feel that they're under threat, or nervous about their well-being, physical well-being, physical safety, economic well-being. It's very common to look around and blame someone else, and then not just blame but attack someone else, right? We see this now with coronavirus. If we feel that it's being brought to us by a Chinese threat, and we already have this imagination of Chinese Americans and Chinese people being unhealthy, right, carrying disease, which has been a long-running narrative, then it doesn't take much to think about them as um, attacking us, them as a threat. And then you try to beat down that threat. And that happens not just through physical attacks, it happens through uh, boycotting their restaurants. Um, it happens through other forms of um, racism. And what's get, what gets lost in this is that many of the cases, most of the cases that have come to the US have actually been not through Chinese um, arrivals. Uh, and yet, so we're not, help, we're not helping ourselves. We're not helping our own public health if we're motivated in some sense by a racial narrative. And we've seen this at other inflection points after 9-11, right? We saw a rise in um, hate crimes against South Asians and Middle Easterners during the um, Japanese um, auto industry rise. We saw attacks on Chinese Americans. Um, so whenever Americans have felt under threat in their well-being, attacking an outside force becomes a, a steadily a standard approach. You know, six of the eight women killed in Atlanta were Asian. Um, Cynthia, I'd like you to talk about how the history of sexualized violence comes into full view with this horrific crime. Well, yes, there's historic precedent and, and there's actually a through line. Um, even before the 1882 Exclusion Act, uh, Chinese women were uh, banned from coming into this country under the pretext of uh, moral turpitude that the suggestion that Chinese women had immigrated here as prostitutes. Um, and if you think about the series of wars, Vietnam, Korean War, World War II, uh, sexualized violence being weaponized um, in times of war, um, and the fact that the shooter systematically targeted three Asian businesses, which largely employed Asian women who symbolize temptation and that he had to eliminate that temptation, which is why it was so offensive and wrong for local law enforcement to suggest that it was not uh, racially motivated. Um, for women of color, uh, misogyny and racism, those are uh, the spaces that we live in. And we know this from our data as Asian women were particularly targeted um, and misogynistic and racist things were said to them as they were being harassed. And Pavan, it's really interesting to note that the US military actually had a role in propping up these stereotypes. Yeah, they did. I mean, as we just Cynthia just mentioned, right, a lot of our wars in Asia, right, have created had just fractured those societies and created a uh, lack of real opportunities. So many women, right, turn to feeling of no other choice, but to turn to a profession of serving servicemen, right, um, romantically, sexually, and that becomes kind of a narrative that gets constructed. And during the Vietnam War, the U.S. Uh, worked with Thailand to create uh, relaxation centers, right, which of course had that component to it. And now Thailand is a major destination for sex tourism. So the U.S. military plays a meaningful role in how Asian women and Asian American women get framed. And that shouldn't be surprising, right? The US military and the US in general has been founded on you know, genocide, violence, slavery. So the military as kind of working to advance the US goals through violence, right? And people of color, whether abroad or domestically, bearing the brunt of that. It's not an exceptional history, right? It is our history. And so what we're seeing here are in some ways kind of the offshoots of that.
much of Asian American history is often left out of textbooks. What kind of an impact does that have on what we're seeing today? Imani, I want to start with you because I know you make it a point to teach Asian American history in one of your law classes. I do. And I, you know, just as a bit of context, I cannot recall at any moment in my formal education uh, having any explicit uh, instruction about Asian American history, that it was actually my relationships with, with friends and mentors and the like that, you know, prompted my interest. Um, but I think the, the, the impact of not having the history is that People think is that this is an exceptional event, um, that they decontextualize it from the history of racism and racialization in the country, um, and that it can be kind of conveniently forgotten uh, that race is uh, not a binary in U.S. history. It never was, um, and that there are distinct forms of racialization and exclusion. And so, um, and, and this is impactful for the entire society. So the ubiquity of, um, of anti-Asian stereotypes, jokes, um, sort of infests our culture, that disposition, and is often written off as sort of, you know, just a, a, a innocent um, uh, playfulness, but in fact is uh, a, a sign of a deeply embedded um, set of attitudes and disregard that really must be confronted at the level of learning. And Cynthia, I think it's so interesting. The Chinese Exclusion Act was in the late 1800s, the Japanese internment camps during World War II. Stereotypes from that era in history still continue on today, in large part, I believe, because the lessons aren't taught in schools. That's right. One of our uh, strong recommendations is that we promote ethnic studies. Um, similarly, I did not learn about my own history and the history of other communities of color. And it has a, a deeply impactful role in terms of the social conditioning that takes place in this country. Um, the fact that we have these preconceived notions about who's prone to criminality, the model minority myth, um, all of the different ways in which we otherize communities, immigrant communities, communities of color, uh, discrimination, uh, gender bias, all of these things uh, are a result of the fact that we don't understand our history, we're missing in history. And it's important to be able to understand that, to be informed about why this is happening today you know, there's also this narrative about vulnerability and weakness of Asian Americans. Where does that stem from? You know, much of Asian American history has been mired by racist policies and xenophobia, but it's also marked by resistance dating back to the mid 1800s from precedent setting discrimination lawsuits to labor strikes. Pavan, if you could just expand on that for us. Yeah, that's a really good point, right? I mean, so much of uh, like what right now, you know, Cynthia and her organization is an activist organization that comes from a long history of Asian American activism, as you said, dating back to the 1800s, whether it be striking as railroad workers, whether it be uh, striking as um, far farm workers, joining with Mexican Americans on the grape strike, uh, whether it be resisting internment and concentration, even putting your own safety at risk to standing up for your principles, whether it be you know, fighting in the military uh, and it's a very decorated unit Right? I mean, you can go on and on, the Asian American movement of the 1960s uh, that was you know, inspired by and, and partnered with the Black Panthers up to nowadays where we're talking about labor rights uh, and other forms of, um, of activism for domestic workers and elsewhere. I mean, Asian Americans get framed as passive, as you mentioned, right? the kind of model minority who's happy to sit back and be submissive and just kind of go along to get along. But we do know that there's a strong history of Asian Americans partnering with other groups uh, in solidarity, you know, during the civil rights movement, uh, Yuri Kochiyama was sitting next to Malcolm X holding his head on the day that he was murdered. Grace Lee Boggs, a major labor rights activist um, who's worked in the African-American communities in Detroit. This is a long history that we should be proud of. Well, let's talk about the model minority myth, because I think that's also created a wedge between Asian Americans and other minority groups. 
how did the model minority myth actually make their struggles easier to dismiss and further cement their invisibility? Imani, I'd like to start with you on this one. So the model minority myth really finds its origin in the context of hostility to the civil rights movement. So the narrative is presented in several major magazines and newspapers that, look, here's a group that is um, not creating all of this trouble with protest uh, and uh, is therefore a better example of what it means to be a person of color in the society. Now, one, you know, as as we've already heard, this is it, it absolutely is a myth with respect to the history of protest, but it also has this repressive function, because if you say repeatedly, well, this is a group that that doesn't disrupt anything or doesn't fight back, then you actually deliberately ignore their history, and also it's an attempt to discipline. Um, Asian Americans out of solidarity with other groups that are marginalized and oppressed. Um, thankfully, um, that that effort to discipline was not ultimately successful to the extent that you know there are um, histories of of, of serious um, solidarity. But um, it it really does both diminish um, the history of organizing and activism, and also the varied experiences of different members of the various Asian American communities. Pavan, in your book, Hyper Education, you talk about the model minority myth and how the stereotype promise plays out in the classroom classrooms. You write that Asian Americans are negatively impacted psychologically by anti-Black racism even as they are being complimented on the surface. Can you unpack that for us? Asian Americans are thought to be really smart and always do well, but because of that, they get unrealistic expectations placed on them by educators um, and others who then, if they don't do very well, wonder what's wrong with you? Why didn't you, uh, you know, do well above average on this test or this assignment? And it creates unrealistic expectations and therefore anxiety and everything else. And this notion that Asian Americans are going to do so well compared to everyone else, as we just referred to, comes from this model minority stereotype that is premised on African Americans and other minorities not doing well. So if we have a stereotype that's premised on anti-blackness, it in turn hurts Asian Americans by creating these expectations that they can't live up to but they measure themselves by, and which hurts their mental health, hurts their well-being. And uh, did the 1965 Immigration Act play into this myth as well? Because it opened up immigration, but it opened it up to professionals, and that created a class divide. Cynthia? Yeah, it's really important to recognize that our community is in incredibly diverse. Immigration status, uh, socioeconomic status, uh, the history of how many of our communities came here to compare uh, professionals who come here to those who have fled war-torn countries is really a disservice and denies our communities opportunities uh, and resources um, that they're entitled to. And so the model minority myth has really harmed our communities um, and it's just plain false. I mean, if you look at the tremendous diversity in terms of our experiences um, and again, immigration playing such a huge role, the fact that uh, so many of our community members uh, are undocumented, make up a significant part of essential workers. Uh, when I think about the workers uh, at the spas that were murdered, uh, the FedEx employees, you know, these are stories that we don't hear enough about. And it's some of the work that we're trying to lead today, which is ensuring that regardless of your immigration status, your ability to speak English, that you are entitled to information and resources and language and opportunities, including education. You know, there's this history of tension between Black and Asian communities. And I think many of us think back to the 1992 LA riots, but there is also a stronger history of solidarity. Today though, in some of the disturbing videos we see playing out on social media of Asian Americans being attacked, it appears that sometimes 
the assailants are black and brown people. Imani, what are we not seeing here? You know, one of the things that I thought about when I first started seeing this was um, a study, a school-based study, where they asked children where they experienced racism. And Black and Latinx kids said they experienced racism in school from teachers, and Asian American kids said they experienced it from Black and Latinx kids. Uh, and I thought this the study was really instructive because part of what is happening is resentment um, that is fueled by this longer historical context of Asian Americans being conceived of as not belonging, as outsiders, as the you know as the yellow peril, right? The sort of this idea of both uh, threat. Um, and non-belonging together, I think, produces these attitudes. And it's really important for us to always keep in mind um, that uh, while the logic of white supremacy has wounded uh, and led to the suffering of many groups of people, that anyone can participate in the ideas that undergird that logic. And that includes communities of color. And so, you know, I think that it, it, it's frankly unsurprising. Um, in and in fact, that it, it highlights for me how imperative it is to show these interconnected histories in order to build solidarity, right, in the, in the present moment. And again, it takes us back to the point about education, because of course, you know, those of us who have access to kind of detailed education about the history of race can see it in a kind of organic fashion, frankly, but it's much more challenging, especially for young people, people who uh, come from underserved contexts to actually have access to the knowledge that facilitates that solidarity, frankly. And Cynthia, I'd love to get your viewpoint on this because you're tracking that data, you're seeing what's happening. Yeah, um, just two things that I wanted to, to point out. One is that you know, in our data, we don't track uh, who is causing the harm um, because we also don't want to contribute towards racial profiling. And uh, we don't feel it is vitally important to know who the person is that's that's attacking uh, or causing harm, because the, rea the reality is that uh, Asian Americans are being subjected to hate in many different places. And there's no one profile. Um, and so that suggests to us that it's systemic um, and there's a pattern and practice that has its roots in the racialized stereotypes of Asians. And I um, uh, have been very much informed by the fact that I lived through the civil uprising in LA and the, there are differences, of course, but some of the things that are similar are issues around structural poverty and the fact that we have conditions where you have people who don't have access to decent jobs, um, the roles that the Korean uh, liquor store owner and mini market owners played um, and the tensions that were sparked there. Our work locally um, has similar issues within the Chinese and black community. And when you de deprive people of their basic needs and then you put new immigrants with more established communities together with language and culture barriers, you are going to see uh, many issues around the drivers of those crimes and violence. And our communities are not immune to those racial stereotypes as well. And so that's the work that we're doing locally is trying to address those racial tensions through racial solidarity and, and healing work that's gonna be necessary. You know, we've heard a lot about racial solidarity, allyships, and intersectionality. What does that actually look like, Pavan? Um, yeah, it can look like multiple things. So it, it takes place in multiple ways, right? On the one hand, it means you know Asian Americans and others showing up at a Black Lives showing up at a Black Lives Matter protest, right? Getting engaged with that movement and being on the front lines advocating for police reform and justice for families. It looks, it is also the same similar kind of corollary where African-Americans and others, Latinx, Native Americans are joining with Asian Americans to stop AAPI hate, 
um, organizations are multiracial in their con in their um, membership and across in Los Angeles and New York and San Francisco across the country, right? Pushing for economic reform, right? Because as uh, Cynthia said, a lot of these problems stem from disparities uh, along social class lines. It also takes place in ways we may not think of them as kind of uh, multiracial um, kind of uh, efforts. For instance, when people get together uh, in a community in a neighborhood to fight for a particular cause, you know, public transportation, uh, stopping gentrification, whatever it might be, that's another opportunity where people are crossing across racial lines for a common interest that joins them together based on their location, based on their conditions. And Omani, isn't it true? I mean, history plays it out at one point in history or another. It's one racial group, then it's another, and then it's another. Um, so just because it seems like your racial group is okay for the moment doesn't mean the fight stops. You know, really a detailed uh, analysis of history is actually what makes that apparent, right? So, um, you know, as an example for me, the that there were, um, I got lit lessons on the history of imperialism from Asian American women who uh, mentored me when I was young, a history of what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and that um, it was both a particular history that was related to um, experiences that they had, but it was a way of interpreting the world, to understand how power works, to understand how um, global politics worked alongside the history of race, that these things, and it is particularly apparent when one studies um, Asian American history, because even the cycle of who's excluded and who's welcomed at various moments in history is, is of course, shaped by global politics. So. I do think that that's true um, and that people ought to be mindful that it might be me next, but also if people want to have a, a sophisticated understanding of just how the world works, that this is essential to know. This is not just particular targeting, it is part of the history, the cyclical history and the repetition of the ways in which groups of people are marginalized or excluded or exploited. Um, and that's worth while knowing in order to be an ethical human being. And Cynthia, I would like to get your take on this because currently, right now, we've seen that spike in anti-Asian hate crime. You know, I, I have this incredible privilege to uh, work with so many Asian American activists, um, as well as in from other communities, in the Black community, Latinx community, Indigenous and LGBTQ communities. And while this is getting a lot of attention, what hasn't been getting as much attention has been this incredible diverse movement. Um, we have been able to respond to this unprecedented level of hate because we've been working for decades to build multiracial coalitions to connect the dots between our legal system, our immigration system, uh, in the ways that it's criminalized, dehumanized us, deported us, banned us, the more that we can come together to connect those dots, the more that we can effectively address those issues. And it's happening locally here where I live and across the country. We're not just showing up to protests, we're actually working towards issues that will address structural inequality, about having good jobs, about climate change, about the fact that women continue to be um, uh, subjected to gender-based violence. These are all issues that we are working together on, and I'm extremely inspired by that, and especially the role that young people are playing in our movement right now. Well, we are coming to the end of, dis of this discussion, but before we go, I want us to close on a forward-looking note. If each of you could just take a moment and please tell us what your personal hope is for the future. Imani, I'd like to start with you. You know, simply put, my hope is that we um, can take this period, which has been devastating for so many people in so many ways, violence, death, disease, um, isolation, um, 
you know, the destruction of the ways in which people make a living, um, all of these things that we have dealt with over the past, you know, year, a year and a half, and that have, you know, longer histories behind them, to really be in a state of deep reflection about who we want to be in the world together. Um, this, these, um, I don't want to say that, you know, that, that the, that the tragedies have happened are sort of somehow have a silver lining, but rather that they should ought, they ought to lead us to a deep reckoning and a deep reckoning that we can do together and actually forge deeper connections. And certainly um, Cynthia's work and many others provide the foundation for us to do that. So I'm grateful. Pavan, your thoughts. Um, I'm picking up on what, uh, Imani said, I guess two key things. One is we really do need to target the rise of like white nationalism in this country. It is a threat and it needs to be taken seriously. Um, and so there should be concentrated focus on that. But beyond that, more broadly, I think about our current moment where we're all wearing masks as we go around. And why do I wear a mask? I wear a mask to protect you and you wear a mask to protect your neighbor and so on and so on. It's that community thinking that we're kind of needing to embrace right now. And I'd like to take that as a starting point and think what would that would mean if we taught our, had our school system and our teachings based on a community orientation model as opposed to a, a rise to the top model, something I write about in my book. What if we think about that as how we approach beyond just our immediate neighbors, but our you know, policies and our, and our programs? Pavan, it's like I tell my kids all the time, it's not about you. <laughs> and Cynthia, finally, I'd love to get your thoughts. Well, first of all, I wanna just thank Pavan and Imani. I, I feel like in this moment, uh, we are reminded that history doesn't teach us, but it's our historians and our scholars. So I just wanna uh, express thanks. I, I felt very flanked today, um, but you know, I have three daughters and I could not get up every morning and do the work that I do without having hope. And uh, while this has been a, an absolutely devastating time, a very dark period in our long history, uh, I am inspired by the fact that we are continuing to speak out. We are continuing to connect the dots and to see that we have shared fate. And what we need to work towards is that any child, any person that is being harmed, we should see in ourselves. We should see that any child that's died at the hands of law enforcement, that that could be my child. Uh, any elder that is attacked on the streets, that, that, that they could be their elder. Um, and that we need to also recognize that beyond the interpersonal attacks, we need to look at how systems, uh, how our institutions continue to perpetuate the harm as well. On that note, I would like to thank our panelists for a very insightful discussion. Imani Perry, Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University, Pavan Dingra, Professor of American Studies at Amherst College, and Cynthia Che, Co-Executive Director of Chinese for Affirmative Action. And for those of you watching, please keep the conversation going. Follow Comcast Newsmakers, where we invite you to comment on key human interest and social justice stories year-round. From all of us at Comcast Newsmakers, thank you for watching.